Hey guys, welcome to The Writer's Journey. This is the show where we are on a writer's journey together, so thank you for joining us. Tonight we are talking about world building, collaborations, and professionalism with Kevin J. Anderson. A little bit about Kevin, and go ahead and hold on to your seatbelts because this is going to be a wild ride. Kevin is the author of over 165 novels, more than 50 of which have appeared on national or international bestseller lists. He has over 23 million books in print in 30 languages. He has won or been nominated for the Hugo Award, Nebula Award, Bram Stoker Award, Seamus Award, the SFX Reader's Choice Award, and the New York Times Notable Book. Anderson has co-authored 14 Dune Saga novels with Brian Herbert. His popular epic sci-fi series, The Saga of Seven Sons, is his most ambitious work, together with its sequel, The Saga of Shadows. He's written a sweeping fantasy trilogy, Terra Incognita, accompanied by two rock CDs based on the novels, which he wrote and produced. He has written two steampunk fantasy adventure novels, Clockwork Angels and Clockwork Lives, with legendary Rush drummer and lyricist Neil Peart. He's also created the popular humorous horror series featuring Dan Shamble, Zombie P.I. His novels, Enemies and Allies Chronicles, uh, the first meeting of Batman and Superman back in the 1950s. He also wrote The Last Days of Krypton. He has written numerous Star Wars projects, including the Jedi Academy trilogy, the Young Jedi Knights series, co-written with his wife, and Tales of the Jedi comics from Dark Horse. Fans might also know him from his X-File novels or Dean Koontz's Frankenstein Prodigal Son, and I know him from standing in line for a sandwich at Awesome Con together with him, that's how we met, and now he's here on the show to talk to you guys today. So, hey, Kevin, thanks for joining us. Sorry, I fell asleep during the intro there. I guess I guess you were talking. All right, go ahead. Hi, guys. Most epic intro ever. It is not my fault. I did not win all those awards and do all. That. <laughs> so it's your own fault doing all the amazing things. All right, all right. I'll take full credit for it. So, <laughs> so here I'm. I'm here to talk about whatever it is you want to talk about. My my recipe for lasagna or something. Is that what we wanted to? Something sure. like that. Sure, whatever. Yeah. We've had so many requests for world building. People are really excited to learn about that. And especially because you've done your own world building and you've jumped into other people's universes with Dune, with Star Wars, with, with all these different series. So we're curious about how to build your own worlds and also how to get into someone else's. And that topic we'll be jumping into in just a little bit. But first, what have you guys been up to? Um, let's start with you. Um, I've been dying of heat stroke. Uh, <laughs> my uh, air conditioner went out about 10, 12 days ago. And uh, the first appointment, the guy had an emergency, forgot to call us. The second appointment, he forgot about us. So hopefully he'll show up tomorrow because it's like 85 degrees in here right now. So if I melt halfway through, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sure you put your characters through worse. So you'll just have to endure it. This That's is true. true. This is true. <laughs> Kevin, I heard you had some news. I've, I've always got news. There's always, I was, I was just talking yesterday. I've got a marketing consultant that I'm doing my newsletters on and she's telling me that, that, um, you know, come out with a newsletter once every two or three weeks or so and only do one thing. Don't list all this stuff. I said, but I've got 10 things that come out every two or three weeks. So, so, um, Anyway, I've got got a couple of things. We have a brand new big epic fantasy book that just came out a week ago called Spine of the Dragon. And I'm gonna, for those of you who are listening, I'm wrestling the pages and holding up the cover here. Big, oh, big is. fat, big fat epic fantasy, lots of characters, very much like like Game of Thrones uh, first seasons, not, not the last season. Um, and it's part of a series and I've already got the second book done by the, I worked really hard to get the second book done the day before the first book came out. So you can always count on me to actually get them out on time. And uh, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. And let's see. And I've got some, uh, Brian Herbert and I have been working on uh, writing Dune novels for 21 years now. We've been working wow. that long. And uh, we're both involved. There's a big budget new uh, remake. Uh, Frank Herbert's Dune call, from Legendary Pictures, and that stars like every big name person from Josh Brolin and and um, Timothy Chalamet and Rebecca Ferguson and uh, just tons and tons of uh, no uh, 
trying to think of there, there's so many people that are in it i'm i'm a jason momoa that you some people oh, yeah, might have heard of him uh all kinds of so that that's coming out and uh they just announced a couple of days ago that uh uh they are doing a a streaming ser series tv series uh dune the sisterhood which is a a, a spin-off series that uh, takes some of the stuff from our our other novels and brian and i are producers on that so that's that's big news for us to be working on on tv stuff and Cool cool movies. Movies. Question from the audience, John Evans, about that. So we'll we'll touch back on that a little bit. Right. Um, and, and you do have to understand that we've got these horrible gag orders, so we can't say anything <laughs> other than the exact words that they told us we can say. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, he, he wants to tell us more people, but he he can't. You can see it in his eyes. He's brimming. I, I want. I want things. to. I. Uh, <laughs> I would tell you, but then I'd have to shoot me. So that oh, no. wouldn't, that wouldn't work <laughs> no, too terribly well. That's not. Uh, well, We'll tempt you about that in just a little bit. Um, but first, uh, we want to jump in. We've got a lot to talk to you about tonight. Super excited. Uh, the, the idea behind the show is the Million Dollar Writing Series, which you have up on Amazon. Four books. We're, we're only going to get to, well, we hope we can get to three of them tonight. And we'll have a special episode on productivity later. Um, but tonight's topic is world building. It's our most requested topic. People really want to know. Uh, you've written in vast universes, Dune, Star Wars, and your own epic fantasy worlds. Um, how how can an author go about creating their own universe? Well, one of the things that that people that people do wrong is that they come up with just like one ingredient and they fixate on that. And now, look, I'm a Star Wars guy. I've written lots of Star Wars books, so I'm not going to really pick on Star Wars, but think about like the original trilogy of, of Star Wars that Yoda's planet Dagobah is the swamp planet. Well, there's no planet that the whole thing is a swamp and, and Tatooine's the desert planet and, and well, you know, Dune also, but they built that ecology out so much and Hoth is the ice planet. And, and you can't just say, and, and this is the, this is the planet with giant redwood trees over the entire land surface. Well, that's not the way ecology works. There are lots of, lots of other things that go into it. And when a long time ago, we had a, a kid in school, like third or fourth grade, he had a social studies class and they were trying to describe for the kids to, to learn this, to learn the culture they were studying, whether it was Morocco or Brazil or something like that. And they gave him an acronym called Persia, P-E-R-S-I-A, like the country. And, it, and the letters in Persia, if, you, if you're trying to understand a whole culture, that you need to understand how the politics works, how the economics works, how the religion works, how the science, work, science works, um, how the intellectuals work as in the, um, like how schooling and everything works. And the A stands for the arts. And so I'm just gonna use that to start with, but then I've added a whole bunch of other things to it. But but the politics, if you're, if you're doing like a big, um, a big fantasy epic. My, I just happen to have one right here. This thing. So as you're, as I'm starting to develop the story, the politics. Well, is it ruled by kings? Is it ruled by um, like a a priest cabal? Is it ruled by by democracy? Is it ruled by uh, does succession happen through mortal combat? Um, is it a caste society or is it a a everybody's equal kind of society? Um, how does the politics work? Because the way the government runs, I mean, do they have paved streets? Do they have tax collectors? Do they have running water? Do they have sewers? All, do they have trash collection? And this is actually important, even in like um, medieval Hobbiton. Otherwise, you're going to have dung heaps and trash middens all over the place, and it's not going to be the nicest place to live. How does the politics work? The E stands for economics. Now, in like old fantasy stuff, subsistence is basically you you hunt animals and eat them and you skin them for their their furs to to uh, keep yourself warm and you cut down trees and you build fires and all of that aside, if the, if it's beyond just survival, what do people do for a living? Um, how does the money system work? And and so there will be, you know there will be woodcutters as a profession because they're just gonna cut down wood and people will buy it rather than cutting down their, their own wood. There will be miners, there will be um, uh, 
merchants and caravans and and there will be um, traders and there and if there's a good enough society uh, a wealthy enough society they might actually have the arts where they might pay minstrels to come in and perform or they might pay somebody to write write books but the economics what do people do for a living now kind of an obvious thing in science fiction or fantasy is that there's usually one rare commodity that everybody wants whether it's like spice on the desert planet from from dune or whether it's like in our world whether it's it's oil in saudi arabia and everybody wants to everybody needs the oil in order to make their cars run and to make plastics and to do all kinds of things well it's almost like somebody wrote wrote a twisted story that the commodity that everybody needs in the world happens to be buried under the crappiest, sandiest desert that's run by a bunch of religious fanatics. Well, that sounds like Dune. Um, that's an interesting thing. Or the other place to get it's like in the North Sea, the wild and storm whipped area. So the harder it is to get something, then it sets up all kinds of stories as to um, why, uh, what kind of people will go and harvest it, um, in, in a lesser extent, like gold is valuable. Well, how do you find gold? Well, you're, you're mining it somewhere or you're panning it out of a river. And, and uh, I've been up in, in Alaska uh, in the Yukon Territory where they still have scars in the hillside from the, uh, from the 49ers gold rush where the like, lines and lines of people would just march across the tundra to find places where they thought they could, they could dig out gold. And when you actually think of it, gold isn't all that useful of a thing it's pretty but there are far better metals to make like weapons and tools and stuff out of but gold is the thing that we call call valuable so you start building your entire um your world your story um say say it's it's um yak butter is the most valuable thing because it's a rare commodity it's only produced by yak herders up in the remote mountains but say the the king likes yak butter so then there's a whole industry of getting caravans to go up into the mountains to get the yak butter and to bring it back before it spoils so then you have to develop ways to preserve it then you have to make roads so that the caravans can get there then you have like guards to guard the caravans you have bandits who are trying to rob the caravan you've got the yak herders up in the mountains that suddenly have become wealthy because this king decides that they're their useless, formerly useless yak butter is now a valuable commodity and everybody wants it. So that's that's more things to think about. Uh, let's go to the R for religion. Um, oh, before you before you go to um, religion, we did have a, a previous question from Anna yeah. Johnson. Um, she wants to know, what is your strategy for ensuring consistency between advancements in the economic, political, religious, social, cultural, legal, technological, and environmental, ooh, there's a lot, and environmental systems of the world. I guess I could have waited until you were done. Well, that's somebody who's really thought them all through. <laughs> yeah, um, you don't have to answer all of those, but yeah, what's your system for organizing that? For um, here in my head, I mean, I'm, I'm, I was always this terrible note taker in college, and so I'm really bad at organizing things in a, I mean, I, I wish that I had some dedicated fan who would just make like a wiki of my seven sons universe so that I could just look it up. Um, I Come remember on, most of it. Yes. I remember most of it just because I'm developing it. Um, it these days more than ever before. I, um, unfortunately, the thing is, is that we live in the real world where things aren't consistent and, and, um, facts aren't consistent and news isn't consistent. And we used to think that if you're writing, I had I had this troll fan um, complaining. One of my my or one series of my Dune books is like the super prequels. They, they're set ten thousand years before any of the events in Dune. It's the origins of everything. And this person wrote in complaining that that like one line of dialogue was different from how history recorded it eleven thousand years in the future. And I went, dude, we can't even agree on two different news networks on the same day of what happened right now. So right. I, I mean. <laughs> In fiction, things do have to be consistent and, and make sense. So I'm, I'm afraid I don't really have a, have a good answer other than you just try to keep notes and make sure that everything follows on. And in, and in fact, that's also a good, for all the stuff that I was starting to rattle off, what you need to do is ask the next question. And one of the, one of the topics that wasn't in the Persia acronym that I've, I've added is about um, climate. So think about a couple of different 
different types of climate. Think about like Eskimos up in the frozen tundra uh, in the Arctic Circle and uh, compare that to like Polynesian Islanders out on the equator in an island that's lush and, and, and tropical. Well, the Eskimos have like 70 different words for different kinds of snow and different kinds of winds because all that is relevant to them. Um, the Polynesians haven't ever, ever, ever seen snow, so they don't know what any of that's about. But the Eskimo has to, um, it's eking out survival. They have to spear the seals or they have to, uh, or think about like the Vikings in, in uh, Scandinavia, that, that they have to catch fish, they have to salt it, they have to smoke it or pickle it or whatever to preserve it because once winter comes, they aren't doing much of any of that at all. They've got to frantically get a year's worth of food during the time that they can get food. Whereas if you're living in a tropical paradise, you can walk out and pluck a mango off the tree just about any any time of the year. You go down to the tide pools and scoop up some shellfish or things. So there's all different, um, different types of things. So look at it. The, the Eskimo, they have very furry clothes because they got to keep warm. But the, the Polynesian is going to have probably very skimpy clothes or very breathable clothes. But because they also have so many... Uh, like bugs and mosquitoes and, and disease carrying like malaria mosquitoes, it's really important for them to have like sheer netting to keep the bugs out. So that would be something that they would develop. One thing that the Eskimos have is when they, when they kill a seal and strip it for meat, they can just set it outside the front door and it'll freeze solid and it stays preserved. If you're in, in Polynesian cultures and you have meat, it doesn't preserve very well. So what happens in like the hot, humid the Indian, Pakistani, um, Arabic cultures, a lot of the island cultures, uh, Thai cultures, they have very, very spicy food because it's the spices that end up driving off the decay so they preserve the food. So you've got a culture in a hot, humid, tropical climate that's going to develop garments that are going to be either, either skimpy or very breathable and lightweight they're going to develop food that's probably going to be um, um, heavily spiced because it's got to be preserved. And there will be lots and lots of fresh fruits and vegetables because they get it all the time. Whereas if you're in, um, in the Arctic Circle, you're going to be eating preserved food a lot of the time. You're going to be worried about staying warm. You're going to be getting food and, and you're going to be worried about um, really good shelter that you can keep yourself warm in. Whereas in... Polynesian islands, they're just going to lean some bamboo against a tree and keep the rain off a little bit. So right. those two things, and, and the Polynesians who are sitting there on their island, they're not going to complain that their air conditioner broke down because they're just going to put up with it. And Eskimos don't know anything about air conditioning. So it's just they, they won't relate to your problem at all. Kate. First world problems. Yes. Um, <laughs> so I cut you off and, on religion. Well, I, I mean, I boy, I, I could talk for it. I mean, I, I give this workshop, I said like two to three hour workshop. So I'm going to, cause you want to talk about the other books too. Um, just time religion, just ans ask your own questions. There's a million different kinds of, uh, whether it's monotheistic religion, is it a peaceful religion? Is it a warlike religion? Do you, is it a tolerant religion or do you want to kill anybody that doesn't believe what, what you believe? Is it a religion that thinks, um, it's a philosophical thing and you can believe what you want or is it a religion that thinks ours is the one and only way and, and we've got the word of God and nobody else has it right but us. So there, me. Um, and is, is there God like this benevolent, wonderful guy who sits on a, on a pillow on a cloud or is it this horrible evil demon that wants to drink the blood of puppies? You know, it, it's different if you worship that kind of God, you're going to have a different personality than if you, than if you um, kind of see the God in, in peonies and tulips and things like that. So all of that, just think of it, how it, how it shapes the culture that, that they're in. Um, science is another big thing. Do they have science? Do they know the earth is round or not? Uh, do, they, uh, do they understand the calendar, because the calendar is really important so that you know when to plant your crops and when to harvest them. And and uh, do they have sciences in like engineering? Do they understand, uh, can they build the steam engine? Do they have a printing press? Do they have gunpowder, which is a pretty important difference? Um, 
Do they believe in vaccinations? Oh, sorry, we don't want to get into that. Um, science, like, depends on everything. And what kind of art do they have? I mean, do they do, think about Greek and Roman sculptures and the pottery that they have and the architecture that they have. It all is the look and feel of a society. Or, I mean, think about the, the Islamic religion forbids the portrayal of a human figure. So all of their artwork is beautiful designs and the calligraphy and the colors and everything, but it's not like the painting of the Mona Lisa, that no Islamic artist would ever paint Mona Lisa because they don't paint people. Um, that's sort of a different thing. Um, do they have freedom of speech? Are their minstrels allowed to criticize the king? Um, is it a repressive society? Do they actually... Do they have the Daily Show or are they struck with only whatever Pravda and Tass broadcasts and they can only say that or read that? Um, all of these things you can start asking yourself, what kind of military do they have? Is it a conscription that everybody has to serve? Is it a voluntary military? Military? Is it a mercenary military? Um, what do people do for fun? Is Are there sports? Is there... Um, gambling? Are there drugs and alcohol? And if so, are they legal or are they illegal? Um, what do they think about prostitution? Is that legal or not? Um, all of these, what you do in your world building, and please don't do this for a 10-page short story, but if you're doing a novel, you just start asking all these questions and building up your society. And what I guarantee you is that as you start answering these questions, you'll think, that's a cool story idea. I need a character who does that. I want to explore that a little bit more. And that's how my books develop into something that's so so big because I've got all this world building. I go, well, I, I need a character that goes and does that. And I need somebody else who, who runs into this situation. So um, that's, that's a really important uh, thing. And so I'm, again, it's a three hour or so class. I'll, I'll flap my little, this is the book on world building. Um, I mean, I've given the lecture so many times that I decided to write it down and flesh it out a little bit. So, so that book, does that really help authors think through their worlds? Mostly like ask the right kind of questions to flesh out the world and to figure out what's going on? Right. It's a whole bunch. It's a whole bunch of categories and a whole bunch of questions. And um, I mean, it's almost like a. it's not a checklist, but I mean, you can go through it and go, well, do I know what my climate is like? And do I know what think about communications? This was, the, we'll, we'll go back to, to Game of Thrones. Um, one of the things they did great in the first couple of seasons, then they did so badly in the, not the last, last season, but the one before it, is it's a big place. They don't have telephones. They don't have telegraphs. They don't have telepathy. So that when something happens up in the north, they don't find out about it down uh, or in in the other continent or way down to the south, they don't just get get an email the next day. It takes months and months and months for this to happen. But yeah. then in the previous season, we've got this group of people stranded on this on this island beyond the wall in the north and the zombies are attacking, attacking them. And one guy gets away and runs all the way back to the wall and all the way back to, to um, uh, they, they send a raven that flies all the way to the south to get to Daenerys and she gets the dragon and goes, oh, we better save them. It gets on a dragon and flies all the way back. I'm flying to Georgia tomorrow on a 747 jet and it still is going to take me three hours to get there. She's on a dragon and somehow she crosses the continent and gets there while they're still on the island fighting the same zombies in the same afternoon. That doesn't happen. <laughs> Unless this land is about a neighborhood wide it just doesn't work so um the point i raise is that communication that your characters across a great land in a fantasy or if you're across um a, a galactic empire somewhere what happens on the capital planet the people on the outer rim don't know about it the next day unless you've got some kind of instantaneous communication and if so, I want to step out of the way as you wave your hand so much to try to tell me that you can communicate instantly across light years of distance. So that's that's a huge thing. And again, a, a, a simpler way of explaining it is, do they have a printing press or not? I mean, do they, 
um, does somebody actually make a copy of something or do they, is it, think about those poor monks transcribing the Bible and making all their mistakes one copy after another after another. I mean, that's, um, and all this stuff is just ideas to think of when you're writing your novel because it's questions and questions and questions. And as you answer the questions, they will be full of story ideas. Now, there. it's about, about 9.30. We're going to take a quick break for a sponsor. And, and just real quick, um, Kevin, do you have a microphone on your um, – on your? I do not. Okay. It, it should be the one on my, on my screen. Okay, okay. All right, that, that'll be fine. Okay, healing. Okay, all right, thanks. All right. Tonight's episode is brought to you by The Eve of War, Ruins of the Galaxy, Book One, by Christopher Hopper. He'd survived ambushes before. This was, this was her chance of a lifetime, but neither of them thought they'd get out of this mission alive. After 300 years of hostility, a feared warrior race requests a peace meeting with the Galactic Republic. Tensions rise when a special unit of Marines is tasked with security for an emissary who doesn't want protecting. You will love this new sci-fi adventure series because adults deserve science fiction that reminds them of their youth. Rated M for mature, 13 plus for language violence, intense themes. <laughs> I just wanted to do it that way. Go click, bye now. I love it. <laughs> Okay, I did have a question for Kevin, but it went poof out of my brain. Um, it was a good one, though, too. A really, really good one. The most important <laughs> question all night long. <laughs> um, yeah, so you said that you organized this in your brain, um, but have you seen any world Bibles that authors use, or have you used world Bibles with Dune or with Star Wars? some a, a document in some fashion that kind of organizes these universes well i've made them i'm just not really good at keeping them up to date as i add little details as i'm as i'm going on um like in the in the world building book that i was just showing there are all these categories that i'm i'm listing and i can use that as like a document as as chapters in my bible or something like that where i'll i'll have a section on climate and I'll just dump everything about climate and I'll have something on, on religion and everything about, about religion in there so that it's, it's there. And I'll usually end up needing to search for some detail. So I don't need it organized like as like a encyclopedia entry so that it's like organized from start to finish. It's more like bullet points that I keep putting in. Um, like my characters, I try to keep a page of a character so that when I describe them in the text, I'll just, copy that and plop it in there so I can look at it again. Um, but by keeping it up into the categories and things, it helps me organize the details, but it's, it's a document for my purposes. It's not for anybody else to read. So it doesn't have to be, um, you know, sensible to anybody but myself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what I use is I have a document that will have one page, well, it starts with one page for, the, for all the characters and the descriptions, another page for weapons, another page for locations, another page for equipment. Um, and it's basically an outline and you can just kind of keep on adding to right. that one. But I find that as an author, it's really hard for me to do that with my own manuscript. But when I'm a reader reading someone else's book, for some reason, it's a lot easier to pick up on all these little details that as an author, just kind of, I don't know. Well, you're welcome to do it all for me if you want to. Oh. <laughs> I need more time. I need a time machine. I need to climb yes. the hole, make more time for myself. And then that would be amazing. I would love that. I might do that anyway. So, I, I mean, uh, so much of it really is in my head. And, and the, pro the problem that I have most is that in the polishing and editing process, I might end up changing some little detail that I won't remember I changed it because it's stuck in my head is how I originally invented it. And then by the time the book gets published, it's been through nine drafts and some editors gone over it and the copy editors and, and I might well have changed something for consistency, but my notes aren't updated like they should be. Right. Well, there, Google Doc, make a Google Doc for all your editors to get on and they can all do it for you. <laughs> Yeah, I'm still trying to get them on fax machines, so let's not 
let's not put too much ahead of them. All right. Did you want to that one here? Go for it. Okay. That one? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So Tyler Davis asks, um, he'd love your insights on into how to work within the confines of a pre-existing world um, with pre-existing characters like Star Wars, for instance. Um, okay, so this goes longer. The Jedi Academy trilogy, trilogy is still up there. Oh, no. Did you write that or did you write that? Yes, I wrote that. No, I didn't. you listen to the 20 minute long bio? That's all, that was all his all. question. Okay. Yeah. The Jedi Academy trilogy is still up there with one of his favorite all time books. Not only did uh, you have to build on top of movies, but he believes there were several elements from the Thrawn books and other things that um, you had to work inside. And he'd also love to know how you feel about the new Star Wars canon, uh, Mara Jade Forever. Well, let's, That's a lot. A broader, the broader question about working in an existing universe. Um, a, a lot of authors who don't write in like media tie-in books, whether it's comics or, or Star Wars or Star Trek or whatever, they seem to get really bent out of shape about that. And, and it doesn't, I don't get it because as a writer, you're supposed to immerse yourself in whatever world you're writing in. And if I were writing like Shogun, some, some Japanese history, uh, historical novel, I would do all my research on Japanese history. I'd get all my maps of Japan and whatever photos that I could get. Um, and I would just sort of try to fill my head with what uh, 17th century feudal samurai Japan was like and get all the details of, of what the characters are like, what they wore, what the geography looks like, and then set my story in that. And it's not fundamentally different to write a Star Wars story that is set inside this universe that's a long, long time ago in a galaxy far away, far, far away. So you watch the movies, you look at how everything looks, you see how um, Han Solo acts and Luke Skywalker acts, and you see how, how all the characters act. You learn the rules of the universe and what can a lightsaber do and what can a Jedi master do and, and how fast can the Millennium Falcon go and is Han Solo a good shot or not, depending on whether Greedo shot first or Han shot first. Um, all of this stuff, you, you or like Star Trek. I watched every episode of Star Trek or the X-Files stuff. I had, um, this tells you how long ago I worked for the X-Files. They sent me a giant box with VHS videotapes of every one of their episodes that I could watch over and over and over again and get the details like what was a, what was Mulder's apartment number and how does Scully take her coffee and all little things like that that you you watch precisely how they work. And you list, especially, in fact, it's easier for things like Star Wars and X-Files that you can actually watch it and you can hear um, Mulder deliver his lines and you can hear uh, Princess Leia deliver her lines and you know what her, her voice sounds like. Um, I don't really know what Teddy Roosevelt sounds like or, or what his personality was like other than what I can read in the history books. But when I watch Star Wars, I mean, Luke Skywalker's right in front of me, so I can see that. And when I was doing the Jedi Academy stuff, um, I was working with Tim Zahn because I was starting to write my first one um, when he was just writing his third one. So he sent me the manuscript to The Last Command, and I read it before anybody else read it, and I got to talk to him on the phone, and we tried to, tried to work our stuff um, together. So it helps being a fanboy. So by, by being a fanboy... Um, meant that I got to watch Star Wars over and over again and read Tim's books as they came out. And I was also lucky in that I was one of the, um, I was the second trilogy. Thrawn was the first and I was the second one. So I didn't have 400 books that I had to read and try to keep track of. It was pretty much three movies and Tim's books and the Ewok Adventures movies, which nobody really paid attention to. And the so holiday special. That's, that's not for... <laughs> Let's not forget the holiday special. So, would you recommend that authors call each other to talk when they uh, collaborate on on world building and stuff? Or because I mean, we have so many options now, texting and email and all that. But yeah, well, I mean, it's however you communicate. I mean, per I I personally 
prefer email or something just because the phone rings, you got to answer it. And I'm in the middle of something. So I would rather do it as, as email or some people do texting, whatever works for you. If you're mm -hmm. talking about, are you talking about actually collaborating with somebody or, um, yes. yeah. So if you're actually collaborating with somebody, you have to find some way of how you, how you work together. And I, I think that, um, I mean, Brian Herbert and I have written, I think 19 novels together and we're plotting some, some new stuff right now. And I mean, we do basic stuff by email and then we do phone calls, but before we get started, um, I go up and I, I stay with him for like three days and we're just sort of all day long in our own little world, just brainstorming and hashing out the outlines and talking about the characters and, and describing the scenes so that before we start writing, um, he and I each have this entire book in our head and every scene and we know what it's, I mean, I don't, I don't know the words in the chapters, but I, we, it's by, basically like we put together and watch the same movie together and then we're going off to write the scene. Yeah. Yeah. So sure. Call each other on the phone if you want, or, or send carrier pigeons or something, whatever, whatever it works. Do what works for you. <laughs> All right, we had a similar question. Uh, this one's from John Evans. I'll try my best to do my John Evans impression. <clears throat> is it easier to build out an entire world that someone else started, or is it easier to build an entire detailed world on your own? I'm asking in reference to Dune. Or, perhaps even better, do you imagine or know if you'll be doing a lot of world building for Dune Sisters of Awesomeness? Always do that, sorry. <laughs> amazing that was good so um yes yes <laughs> well i mean the, the 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 basic part of the question is it easier to do uh, basically f fill into like the existing star wars universe or to work on on my own original stuff um yes i mean it's yes it's easy to just step into the shoes of working on on Dune because somebody else has already paved the roads and map, mapped out the continent and they've got things so that I can just explore it. But on the other hand, I've got to stay on the roads and I got to do what's already there. I mean, maybe that's, that's pushing the metaphor a little bit too much, but it's, if, if I write a star Wars story and I say that, Han Solo flew the Millennium Falcon to Tatooine and he looked across and uh, saw his co-pilot Chewbacca. You know what every single one of those things is without me describing any of it. But if that was my original story and I introduced an original captain character of mine with an original ship and another co-pilot flying over another planet, I would have to explain all of that to you before you could even get started. So that's a lot harder to get started because there's so much information you need to put in there. But again, I, I can do whatever I want. I can kill off the characters or I can make up the rules and I can do the, the magic system or the science or whatever I want. So um, there's a lot more freedom, but you know, if I'm working in, in X-Files or Dune or Star Wars, I've got, you know, I've got the thing that is already started and the fan who picks up the book that says Dune on the cover is already a Dune fan, I hope, or they're already expecting something. So it's like they've got a, a running head start. So on the one hand, creating a whole new world and creating new characters and creating new systems that no one's ever seen before, that's really cool and exciting and it adds color and layers to your story. But on the other hand, every time you come up with something completely original, you're going to need to do a whole lot of work of describing it, explaining it to your reader. You know, you make new races that no one's ever seen before anywhere. You're going to have to to describe that not every time, but at least the, the initial time. So you, there's like pros and cons to creating new stuff. Do you make right. a whole lot of brand new stuff from scratch, like brand new creatures, brand new uh, weapons, brand new? Uh, well, e even in even in Dune, we do that because we go to yeah. different planets and we flesh them. All. I mean, one of the in, in our first trilogy, the House Atreides, House Harkin, and House Carino, um, one of the first things is Duke Leto goes to the planet of Ix. You've heard of Ix from the books, 
it's a planet where they do a lot of machines, but you don't know anything else about it. And we created like this really, really cool society and a cool environment. And, and it's that they do all their technological stuff because the surface has been kind of devastated by an ancient war. So it's all underground in these gigantic caverns, but they've got, you know, like, like skyscrapers shooting up to the, to the sky. Well, these things are all built as like stalactite buildings. So they come down from the ceiling nice. and they're, and so that was cool. And, and they're building these gigantic guild highliner ships inside these grottos because they're Ixians are doing all the, all the, um, uh, construction and the technology, but they built this huge starship inside a cave and how do they get it out? Well, the navigator folds space and it just winks it out from here to there. And it's, all of this is just really cool stuff. I, I know because I'm rereading House of Trades right now and I just finished all those chapters and I went, oh yeah, that was 20 years ago, but that was really pretty cool stuff. And, yeah, I just read The Butlerian Jihad. Uh-huh. And really There's some great stuff yeah. in there. Yeah, exactly. And and some, some new stuff that I'd never seen before in, in different worlds too. Um, but a lot of it's also kind of recognizable and that does help the imagination when when some of the civilizations look recognizable, some of the, the creatures and, and the AI, you know, kind of looks recognizable, but a little bit different too. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that makes it easier for the, the reader to kind of plug in. Right. So it's your job as a writer to make the reader invested in it. And even if, uh, I mean, even if you're in Star Wars, Luke Skywalker could go to your own original planet that you make up the the cities or the cultures or whatever. So it's not like you're ever constrained that you, I mean, if you don't have an imagination, you're in the wrong business anyway. But, but if you've got an imagination, even if you are writing a book in the X Files or in Batman or Superman or in Star Trek, that there, there's plenty of creative things to do. Awesome. Do don't ask more? me to answer in a British accent next time. So. Uh, did you want to go on to collaboration, Lauren? Yeah, I guess we should. Or professionalism? Um, or? They've, they've well, got a couple what? questions. Because professionalism is like its own hour or something like that. <laughs> so we kind of started on collaboration. Why don't we oh, yeah. do a little bit of that? Because we've only got, what, like another 15, 20 minutes or something like that? Uh, you know, it's if you want to leave right on the hour. He's got to. Right. He's got uh, things to do. I have things to do. I've got like three more chapters to write tonight. Yeah. And then, and I'm getting up at four in the morning to go open up a Challenger Science Center in Columbus, Georgia tomorrow. So you have to share uh, him with the world. Yes. Okay. So <laughs> real life. And I got to pet my cats and spend time with my wife. So All right. collaboration. Speaking collaboration. of your wife, you collaborate with her a lot. That's yep. really cool. So, and the book is? The book is Writing as a Team Sport, The Complete Writer's Guide to Collaboration, because I've written like 30 books with my wife, Rebecca. I've written 20 books with Brian Herbert. I've written, I think, a dozen books with uh, my co-author, Doug Beeson, who is a PhD physicist and a retired colonel in the Air Force. And we've got a, a new high-tech thriller coming out in August. Um, then I've collaborated with Dean Kuntz and Mike Resnick and Sarah Hoyt and all kinds of other people. So um, I play well with others is what the grade school teacher says. <laughs> So first big question, what are some reasons why an author might want to get into a collaboration? Well, especially as newer authors, if you're collaborating with one of your peers, you will learn a poop load of stuff. Just by writing with somebody else, you'll learn a thousand different techniques that you would never have thought of earlier. And if you're collaborating with somebody, try picking somebody that has skills that, that you don't. Like, for instance, if you're um, say you're really great at writing like action scenes and doing world building, but your characters aren't great. Well then collaborate with somebody who does great characters. And then you can learn from your co-author about characters and your co-author will learn from you about science or action writing or world building or something like that. So, um, I always like to pick, well, specifically cause I just mentioned I've collaborated on all these like Michael Crichton, Tom Clancy type high tech books, uh, with Doug Beeson. Well, Doug Beeson, he worked for the president's science office. He's a retired Air Force colonel. Uh, he ran the, the Air Force uh, Space Command here at the Colorado Springs Air Force Academy. Um, 
He's been a research physicist at Los Alamos National Laboratory. He's worked in Washington, D.C. So this guy's got all of the high tech and the political chops that you could possibly want. And so when I write with him, he brings all that to the table. I, I never took a civics class. So when I watch the news, I don't even know how the Congress and the Senate and the House works and, and why does it take that long to get a bill passed and all this. But he works in Washington, so he knows all of that stuff. And with him, we've got all the science, cutting edge stuff that's really right. And then I work on um, maybe the characters are better or the, the writing style or something. And we plot it together. And we write a book that neither of us could do individually. Um, collaborating with Brian Herbert is kind of obvious. He's the son of Frank Herbert and we're writing Dune books. So, um, and Bri but Brian himself brings a lot of skills to the table because he's got uh, my degrees in physics and astronomy with a minor in Russian history. And he's got a degree in comparative religions and philosophy. So you add that stuff to the Bene Gesserit and the Fremen philosophy and everything. And then I've got the science background and the action writing and the world building. And you put all that together and we come up with books that, that we think are better than either of us could do ourselves. Um, when my wife and I started writing the Young Jedi Knights books for Star Wars. Uh, Lucasfilm asked me to write a young adult series, but Rebecca was the young adult writer. I was writing adult books. So we worked together on, on doing those. So when you put it together, you come up with a collaboration that, that other people, that, that nobody else could do but, but the two of you. But um, there are other techniques of collaboration, like the way... The way I do all of mine is that my co-author and I, we, we brainstorm. I mean, we, we talk out the whole book together. We outline it. Um, I, like the Young Jedi Knights books were, it's, I forget, like something like 30 chapters long. So we would brainstorm the whole thing and we'd break them up into the chapters. And I would pick the Kevin chapters and Rebecca would pick the Rebecca chapters. Usually I would write the the action ones and the fighting the monster ones and she would pick the character ones and the talking about how bad they feel for killing the monster and stuff like that. Um, and so we just pick our chapters. We write our individual chapters, which is about half of the book for each of us. And then we exchange, exchange files and I rewrite all of Rebecca's chapters. She rewrites all of my chapters um, on online. This is kind of a key. We don't do any of the handwriting marking up or track changes because you're supposed to trust your collaborator and I should be trusting what she wants to rewrite and she should be trusting what I want to rewrite. And if you have track changes on or if you're actually marking up a manuscript, there is this, this sense in our head that the other person's the teacher grading your paper. And that's not what you're supposed to be doing when you're collaborating. You should not be having one person grading the other person's work. You're putting it together to come up with something that that is a real synthesis of what you can do. So we'll outline, we'll write each other, we'll write our own chapters, and then we'll exchange drafts and we'll keep going back and forth. I'll polish the draft and then my co-author will polish it and then it comes back to me for a polish and then it go back goes back to them for a polish until it's pretty much smoothed over you can't tell any of our chapters which whether i wrote them or, or whether my co-author wrote them now those are genuine collaborations there are lots of other types of collaborations that there's almost like a a, <clears throat> a master and padawan one where there's those are usually like a big name author and a a lesser known author. Um, James Patterson does these all the time. Where it's James Patterson and tiny print guy. Um, or, or even better for, for our genre, like Anne McCaffrey used to do lots of books where Anne McCaffrey would co-write with a junior writer that she was mentoring. And in those cases, what Anne McCaffrey would do is, is she would write up the outline, like a five page, here's what happens in the book. And then the junior writer would write the whole draft and then Anne McCaffrey would give it the final polish. So that's, that's putting the burden on the junior author to do like most of the work. Um, I've done some like that, but in a lesser 
for me, it's more like a first and final draft thing where one person will write the whole first draft and the other person will do the final draft. And for me personally, I love doing the writing the first draft and I hate doing the editing. So if I can collaborate with somebody who hates doing the first draft and loves doing the editing, well, that looks great. I get to do the fun part and he or she gets to do the fun part. Um, that's the way Sarah Hoyt and I did our book Uncharted. It's a alternate American fantasy. It just won the Dragon Award and uh, Barnes and Noble picked it their best alternate history of the year. And I mean, there's, so it turned out fine, but it, it's a, uh, Lewis and Clark and Arcane America. So it's the world has changed. Magic works. Lewis and Clark go to explore the West, but there's like dinosaurs attacking buffaloes and there's uh, Native American literal shapeshifters and there's um, weird zombies walking around. So it's a, it's an adventure, but Sarah did all the research because she's a historian. She wrote the first draft and then I did the final polish on it. And that was mainly because the book was due and I was really swamped with deadlines and I didn't have time to write the first draft. So she took all of that heavy lifting and then I did all of the, the polishing at the end. That's the way that one worked. Um, another kind of collaboration is um, like novelizations where it's not really a collaboration. I've, I've collaborated with dead people um, a couple of times where um, like I got their notes or the draft of something that they were working on when they passed away. And then I'll just finish it up. Um, movie novelizations are a similar thing where somebody hands me the script that they wrote and I have to turn it into a book, but I really have to follow everything that they listed in the script. I can't go off and rewrite sections and things. So um, those are, that's kind of the rundown of the, the basic ways of collaborating. But one thing that you have to keep in mind is that this is effectively like a marriage. You're just really getting into intimate stuff with each other. You're playing with each other's characters and your stories and your somebody else is, is, is rummaging through their prose and fixing it and correcting your grammar. And, and you have to be the right sort of person to do this. If you're a diva, I wouldn't expect you to be able to do this. I mean, if your, if your work is perfect and precious and nobody else can touch it, well, then try not to collaborate with somebody. But for me, it's all about telling the story and I want to get the story out and I want to get the characters done. And there are a hundred different ways to write any one sentence. So as long as it's clear and communicates what's supposed to be, um, I'm, I'm happy with that. And I usually have co-authors who are um, on the same mindset as well. So I think that's, I should reread my own book because I published it last year and it's been, uh, I mean, it definitely sounds like when you're yeah. going into a collaboration, um, you need to ask yourself, what are you comfortable with? You know, um, right. what, what are you really capable of? Where are your strong points and find someone who can fill in those weak, those weaknesses if you can, you know, and, and definitely, yeah. Be like, what are we going to do? How's this going to go? You know, don't leave that out to the you know, the month before the book's supposed to be done. <laughs> well, and, and just and do it as an experiment first. I mean, just try a short story or something and see if it works. If it doesn't work, well, then stick it in a drawer and it's fine. Um, another thing that, that I discovered that most people won't, won't point out is if you're picking a collaborator, make sure that you pick somebody that has the same, like, work ethic and work speed as you do because I'm – I'm a prolific writer and I write all the time. And if we're working on a book together, I'm going to go bam, bam, bam and get like chapters done every day and get my, my book done. And if I'm writing with somebody who like waits for the muse to strike for a paragraph every three weeks, well, that's just not going to work for me because I'm going to be all done with the book and I'm going to be, be haranguing them. Um, another thing to really watch out for picking a collaborator is plot, plotters and pantsers don't work well together. Um, it's fine if you're a pantser, but don't try to work with my outline if you're a pantser because I'm going to write chapter three, and if you don't do what I expect in chapter two, it's going to mess us all up. Um, pantsers can work together because what they do is I'll write chapter one and then see where it goes, and then they'll take it and write chapter two and see where that goes. But if if you're if you're plotters and you both have got a hundred chapter outline for your book, 
well, then you each need to know what happens in your chapter and you need to write what you're, you're agreeing on. Um, I've seen some pretty disastrous things where a plotter and a pantser tried to work together and it, it just wasn't pretty. So, um, opposites do not attract apparently in this situation. <laughs> right. So, really I mean, it, it, really it's intrigued by the whole not using track changes thing. That, that sounds like a, a leap of faith, but also like telling the person you're collaborating with, I trust you, I'm in this together with you, and I'm willing to, to give up my darlings if, if you say so. Like if you're gonna delete it, you're just gonna delete it and we're gonna have to move yeah. forward from that. Well, you know, you're sharing custody, so it's not like your darlings, it's, it's, <laughs> in fact, Brian, Brian, Her Brian Herbert and I have, a, have an agreement that we, we never specify if somebody asked us with like, who wrote this chapter? Who wrote this character? Sorry, we both wrote all of them. Um, and in fact, I just, not too long ago, we watched uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, the, the Queen movie. Mm -hmm. And that was this big thing, the whole band, and, and they had the band was tearing apart and they came back together. When they came back together, they said, from now on, we aren't gonna list who wrote the lyrics, who wrote the music, all songs written by Queen, that's it. And that's what your collaboration is. All songs written by the two of you. Um, you don't say who did what because it's a it's a shared thing. When you have a kid, you don't say, "Well, I did the eyes and the nose, but ooh, you got the knees." And you know that's not the way children work. That's good advice. It's very good advice. Well, so that's a weird comparison, but all right. So since I was told you have to go. We are one minute over. Um, uh, thank you so much for coming and hanging out with us. I wish we could go longer, but can you let our viewers and our listeners know where they can find you and your stuff and all your glory? Well, I'm on um, I'm on Facebook. If you just look official Kevin J. Anderson page, it's that's not too hard to find. Um, Twitter, it's it's the word the, and then my initials KJA. So it's at the KJA. Um, Let's see, my website is wordfire, like wordsonfire.com, but we're in the middle of updating it. So it's, although there's a big spine of the dragon good order link on it. So you can, you can do that to get your, your stuff. And um, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm leaving this weekend. I'll be in Columbus, Georgia. It's, this might not be up by then, but Columbus, Georgia to open their, their Coca-Cola Space Science Center. And I'm giving a talk, but I do lots and lots of, of comic cons and appearances and I try to list them all on my on the wordfire.com website so you can come see me for that and you know we we've talked about two of my 165 books here in the three <laughs> in the past hour so let's do the math and figure out how many times you have to come back on but or, or maybe not Lots. we're gonna, uh, it's gonna be a block party well we we do we do need to we do need to come back on maybe September or so because I've got another one of these writing books out uh, called on being a dictator because one of my big things is I go out hiking and I write I write with a digital recorder and so yeah. many people have asked me so many questions about dictating instead of typing that we did a whole book on it and I'll we'll we'll tie that in with the productivity because that's one of the ways that I get really productive is by dictating so I have to be on again but in the meantime um, you've got this this gigantic tome to read that'll keep you busy in the meantime so so thanks right. both of you guys <laughs> yeah you guys heard it here he's going to be talking dictation productivity the september area we'll let you know but to everyone in the live chat thanks for hanging out with us let us know what you thought about the show in the comments show your support with the thumbs up and hit the subscribe button and a little bell we always love to know <laughs> so you always know when we've got more going on for Lauren Moore, I'm Kayleen Williams. Thank you for joining us on your writer's journey. We'll see you next time to talk about reading, writing, and everything in between right here on Keystroke Mediums, The Writer's Journey. Good night. <laughs>